Hi, I'm Josefina Estrada, and welcome to Boiler Bites, the show that gives you an in-depth look at what's happening on the Purdue campus. In 1994, an ancient hominid skeleton named Littlefoot was discovered in a South African cave. How old is the skeleton? More than 20 years later, researchers are still trying to pinpoint a burial date. Thanks to the collaboration of two Purdue professors and a powerful new instrument, they may finally have their answer. It's Turkfontein Cave, it's in South Africa. It's in a sort of low, rolling, hilly landscape, and you can see places where the cave used to open up to the surface, and um, dirt and rocks would fall in, but also animals would fall in and leave their piles of bones in with the, the piles of rock, these breccia cones that are inside the cave. So people have been excavating these deposits really since the 1930s. It's been one of the richest fossil uh, sites in the world. There have been about 500 different specimens of Australopithecus, uh, an early hominid that uh, came from the top levels of the cave. Down in the bottom levels of the cave, uh, that's where Littlefoot was found. Littlefoot was first discovered by Ron Clark. He was going through some boxes that were excavated earlier from Starkfontein, and he found a few foot bones in there. This was way back in 1994. And he realized that these bones had been broken off by the lime miners. So he asked his assistants um, to go into the cave and see if they could find the matching bones uh, where they had broken off on the shins. And after just a couple of days of looking, they actually found that. And so they started to excavate these out. In the end, it took them about 20 years. And that's because the the skeleton itself is pretty soft, but they're inside a breccia, inside this, these rocks that have fallen around the skeleton that are extremely hard. So he's been using air scribes, almost like dental tools, to extract a whole skeleton from what would be like a block of concrete. And I contacted the, the researchers in South Africa when I realized that maybe I could use my cave dating method to date the sediments that are around these fossils that they find in the caves. So we're not actually dating the bones themselves. What we're dating is all of the rocks that fell in the same time as the bones, the rocks that are underneath it and on top of it and beside it. So in my research, I use what are called cosmogenic isotopes. Um, these are very rare nuclides that are produced inside mineral grains from cosmic rays. It's it's basically radiation, particles coming from outer space. So I work with the mineral quartz. Any piece of quartz that's exposed near the ground surface builds up inside it. Aluminum-26 and beryllium-10, these are radioactive isotopes that decay over time. So if you have a piece of quartz that's exposed, the concentrations build up. If you bury it, then the concentrations decay away. You can tell when quartz was carried into a cave, when it was deposited underground. And I realized, um, back when I was working on my, my PhD, that this would be a great method to date cave sediments. We use accelerator mass spectrometry. It's a, an ultra-sensitive method for measuring these rare isotopes. It's the only way that we can measure aluminum-26 and beryllium-10. We actually go in and we count the individual ions, the individual atoms that make it through the machine. My uh, association with this project comes through working with Professor Granger. So he was talking about uh, the uh, work in South Africa, and I thought this was just fascinating. And we have a large machine that uh, was initially installed in the late 60s to do nuclear physics research, and we've converted it to a, an accelerator mass spectrometry. So we're one of a, only a handful of places in the world that can make these kinds of measurements. And so for beryllium-10 and aluminum-26, there are interferences. So for aluminum-26, the premier interference is magnesium-26. So when we measure that sample, the magnesium-26 is going to get in our, into our detectors. And that's what compromises the aluminum-26 measurement, the way we were doing it. So with the gas-filled magnet, what this enables you to do is to eliminate the magnesium-26. So behind you right here is what we call a gas-filled magnet. So in this particular uh, case where we're running aluminum-26, both the aluminum-26 and the magnesium-26 make it into this gap between the pole tips of the magnet. They experience a magnetic field which is going to bend them around this way. You can see going around this magnet. But since there's a gas in there, they'll each be losing, on average, a different number of electrons. And that will put them on slightly different radii of curvature. 
That means then that the magnesium-26 won't even make it into the detector. So all that's in the detector then is aluminum-26 and a few other stray counts, which we can tell. We can uh, distinguish the aluminum-26 uh, atoms from the other atoms. And so it gives us a very clear signal and uh, the results are then unambiguous. The little foot skeleton is very remarkable. This is definitely not Homo sapiens. It's a hominid, um, so it walked around like us. It had a fairly large brain. It's about 90% complete, um, and we know now that it's about 3.7 million years old. It was just fantastic. Uh, we got uh, results that agreed with our previous measurements, but the uncertainty was much, much uh, better, and we had a lot more confidence in these measurements. This is a quartz hand axe. Uh, it came from another place in South Africa. Um, so hominids were making stone tools out of quartz, and we can go in and we can date either these rocks or the rocks around them and learn about how technology changed over time. When did hominids actually learn how to make a fairly sophisticated tool like this. You know, while I love studying glacial features and I love studying meteorites, uh, really trying to nail down the, uh, the uh, particulars of hominid evolution is a very, very significant problem. So it has a lot of consequences. So this was really exciting for me to be involved with this. I think it is important to recognize this is the work of a lot of people. Uh, Ron Clark has been excavating the skeleton. Uh, Kathy Kuman has uh, worked on the archaeology that we dated. Uh, Ryan Gibbon, uh, who was working in my lab. And then, of course, uh, Mark Caffey and the whole staff at Prime Lab here at Purdue have all contributed to this work. This is really interdisciplinary science. It involves uh, physicists, involves geologists, involves other people from other disciplines. So this is a true example of interdisciplinary work. Professor Mark Caffey says that the future is bright for this new burial dating technique. He also hopes to adapt the gas field magnet to measure other radionuclides for a wide range of scientific research. That wraps up another Boiler Bites. Be sure to check us out online at BoilerBites.com. See you next time.